All right, let's stand to our feet. Let's give God his praise this morning. Come on, put your hands together. Give you my word. 
this morning is just to let go. I'll never forget, as my mom was in the hospital room, she had a stroke, and as other things transpired in my life, I just constantly heard the word of the Lord, and He said, let go. And I believe some of you walked in this place this morning, and it's time to let go. You've been holding on too long. And when we just give Him everything, you'll be surprised at what He can take. Come on, you were never supposed to carry it on your own. So Lord, I just pray over every person in this room. Lord, I pray for the people that have maybe lost loved ones, that have lost things that they, they never expected to lose. And Lord, I just pray that this morning that we can give everything to you, all of our feelings, all of our emotions. Lord, you're so worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Lord, we give everything to you. Every part. Tear down the 
altars of self-righteous plans The idols built to fear of men The lie I have to work my way to you yes. Flip every table of religiousness To holiness is all that's left Just worshippers in spirit and in truth Let's sing that again Take down the altars of self-righteous plans The idols built to fear of men The lie I have to work my way to you Yes And flip every table of religiousness To holiness is all that's left Just worshippers in spirit and in truth And we're not sad with empty words, not satisfied with playing church. We want a real encounter. We want a real encounter. We won't settle for a lukewarm faith. We're living for the face to face. We want a real encounter. We want a real Oh 
Many of you remember the first time that you encountered Jesus. I remember the first time I encountered Jesus. It changed my life. And I couldn't but help go and share my faith and Jesus with other people. You know, Pastor and I, we just arrived back from Africa yesterday and and I was so challenged while I was there. We spent all of our time with Pastor Jacques. And you know, everywhere that he went, he shared Jesus, everywhere. Didn't matter if it was the woman waiting on us. It didn't matter if it was where we were staying at. Wherever we went, he shared Jesus. Can I just be honest with you? I felt conviction in my heart. You know, we encounter Christ and our life is changed and we get on fire for Him and we want to share Him with other people. But as life happens, sometimes we just get busy about doing our own thing. And we forget that there are people all around us that are lost looking for hope. And church, we are called to be Jesus to the lost and to the hurting. And I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied with lukewarm faith. I'm not satisfied. And I just believe that He's called each and every single one of us to be on fire for Him. Can you imagine, can you imagine if we went to our schools and we shared Jesus with the ones that are lost and hurting? Can you imagine going to Walmart and sharing the lost, sharing with the lost Jesus Christ, the hope that we have inside of us? I wanna pray over you this morning. Church, let's not be satisfied with lukewarm faith. Father, we cry out to you this morning. We want a real encounter. Lord, forgive us for just going through the motions. <laughs> because we have you living on the inside of us. And Lord, as Abigail said earlier, Lord, maybe some of us are holding on to things that you just ask us to let go of. And today we surrender to you. Lord, set our hearts ablaze for you. Lord, that when we are with other people, they will say, I perceive they've been with Jesus. So Lord, set us ablaze, set us on fire for you once again. Father, we love you this morning. And we thank you that you are a good and merciful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome to Life Community. It is so good to be back home. We missed you guys. You know, it's wonderful to go away and see what God is doing over in South Africa. And he is doing a wonderful work. I'm sure Pastor is going to tell you more about that. But it's so good to be back home. And if this is your first time, we just want to say welcome. In front of you, there is a blue connection card. And if you'll take that connection card out and fill it out as you leave today, there'll be men at the back door with a bucket. And you can just place that card in that bucket. And that we just want to send a gift to you this week, a Gringo's gift card, just telling you how much we appreciate you being with us. 
Uh, ladies, do y'all know what's coming up? Our wow gathering. We have a few spots available. We've already sold over 330 tickets, so we don't have a whole lot of space left. Invite a friend. It's going to be a powerful night. I know that God is going to show up, and he's going to do some amazing things, and you don't want your friends to miss it. Uh, but you can still get your tickets. We've ordered a few more shirts, so if you didn't get a shirt, there might be a possibility for you to get a shirt. But we are so glad that you joined us today. Turn to your neighbor and welcome them this morning. Hey, good morning. Wait a minute. If I can say good morning, you ought to be able to say good morning. Amen. We begin our trek back, uh, what would be your time Thursday morning, 4 a.m. Arrived home yesterday afternoon at 5 o'clock after 37 hours of travel. Amen. Yeah, it was a great trip. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about it. We were there to celebrate the one-year anniversary of Celebration Church in Mokopani, Africa, Uh, We have the privilege of serving uh, as one of the overseers of the church there that Pastor Jock leads. Uh, The church has grown basically from not a whole lot of of people to two services and over 300 people in one year. The first, it it is the first multicultural, multiracial church in that part of Africa. Uh, and God is doing an incredible work there by His Spirit. And we're just, we, we are so humbled and proud at the same time of Jock and all that's been accomplished there. And, and the work continues and uh, grows and the work in Zambia continues and grows and what God is doing uh, and changing people. And through you guys all over the world, somebody say amen. amen. I want to reiterate something Pastor Shelley said. If you're a guest with us for the first time, we want to tell you welcome. Uh, be sure and fill that card out. And secondly, starting o- October 5th, that's a few weeks away. If you've never gone through Welcome Home, it's a class. Pastor Shelley and I host the class. You're personally going to get to know us. That we have uh, made this great commitment to say this. No matter how large this church may get, we would like to get to know every person here and try to remember everybody's name. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. And so you're going to get three weeks with us, whether you like it or whether you don't. We're going to have three weeks together. Uh, we're going to eat together. We're going to fellowship together. We're going to hang out. And you're going to find out a lot about Life Community Church, where we come from, who we are, uh, and where we're going. And there's a lot happening of where we're going in the next few years that I really believe that together, you understand something, together we can leave a legacy here on this planet. Somebody say amen. amen. So Jesus, Terry, we can leave more than buildings behind. Uh, I'm excited about that calling and vision that God's called us to, and uh, I want you to become a part of what God's doing in that, because I really believe that God's not finished with this planet. I don't believe he's finished with this country. Wait a minute. I don't think he's finished with this country. Uh, And so we've got a lot, lot to do, and God's put a lot on our plate, but we're so thankful to have the opportunity to serve him. You know, I was reminded when we were in Africa, as Pastor Shelley said, uh, it's always very, very challenging to us, Uh, and I mean challenging our heart in a good way, to be with Pastor Jock, because everywhere we go, we share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's always a good challenge for all of us. But secondly, we were out one day, and uh, he allowed me one time, one time, to pay for lunch the whole time we were together. I, I, I basically kind of strong armed my, myself to taking the, taking the bill away and paying for lunch. Uh, and I was figuring out the tip. Um, and he said, well, what do you want to give? He sa- I said, well, Jock, I always give 20%. He said, well, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. He said, you mean you always give 20%? 
I said, let me teach you something about who we are in Jesus. And I got a chance to teach him for something. You see, I don't let anybody else determine the kind of giver that I am. Did you hear what I just said? I don't let anybody else determine what kind of giver because God has called me to be a giver. So if you get to wait on me at a restaurant, understand you're going to get at least 20%. Whether you give me good service or bad service. Somebody say amen. Because who you are doesn't determine who I am. And the same thing goes for our tithe. You understand, we could say, well, the economy determines whether I'm going to give or not. You understand, your faith should always overcome your circumstance. Who are you? Who are you? I am a child of God. How many of you are a child of God today? And so what that encourages us is to do and be is to be givers. I want to be a giver just like my father in heaven is a giver. He gives to me every day. There's not a day that goes by that he has not given to me. How many of you, how many of you can say that, that God gives to you every day? And so we're to be like him. Be like your father in heaven. We're going to talk about that this morning. Stand with me. We're about to get in the word. Hold your hand over your heart. God, only you can change our heart, but we have to change our mind today. So in the midst of this place, by your spirit, would you come into this place today and challenge us? But Lord, would you do more than challenge us? Would you begin a change in who we are today? No matter how long we've gone to church, no matter how much we profess to know or understand God, would you really come and begin to change our heart again? And I thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've entitled this message, The Whole Man. This is part one of a series. And here's the kind of beginning to this. I don't have time to go into the full subject matter today. So we're going to break this down over the next several weeks because it's very intense. And what's going to happen is I hope that by the time we reach the end of this series, you're going to begin to rethink what you really believe. Because there are a lot of modern misconceptions in American Christianity. I mean, huge misconceptions that affects how we believe and what we believe. And so I've entitled the whole man, before we get there, remind me of this story about a guy who didn't believe in God. He was an atheist. Uh, He was walking through the woods, and as he walked, he said, what majestic trees, what powerful rivers, what beautiful animals, he said to himself. As he was walking alongside the river, he heard the rustling in the bushes behind him. He turned to look, and he saw a seven-foot grizzly bear charging toward him. He ran as fast as he could down the path. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the bear was closing on him. He looked over his shoulder again, and the bear was even closer. He tripped and fell on the ground. He rolled over to pick himself up, but saw the bear was right on top of him, reaching for him with his left paw and raising his right paw to strike him. At that instant, the atheist cried out, Oh, my God! Time stopped. The bear froze. The force was silent. As a bright light shone shone upon the man, a voice came from the sky that said this, you deny my existence for all these years. You've taught others I don't exist. And even credit creation to a cosmic accident. Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament? Am I to count you as a believer? The atheist looked directly into the light and said, it would be hypocritical of me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian now, but perhaps you could make the bear a Christian. (laughs) Very well, said the voice. The light went out, the sound of the force resumed, and the bear dropped his right paw, brought both paws together, bowed his head, and spoke, Lord, bless this food, which I'm about to receive (laughs) from my bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. (laughs) We're going to talk today about a change of heart. But more importantly, we're going to talk about the nature of God within. How is it possible to change one's heart? Or is it even possible to change one's heart? I want to understand, here's our first little point today. Without a heart change, a change in behavior is an act of futility. Did everybody hear what I just said? Without a heart change, a change in behavior is an act of futility. And here's what you need to understand something today. We cannot change our heart. Did everybody hear what I just said? It's impossible. You can't change your heart. 
Only God can change our heart and our nature. But our heart represents both our spirit and our nature. Let me stop for a minute so you understand. If you're a person given to anger and you succumb to anger, you understand it is your nature, it is your spirit. Jesus addressed certain things. He said, there is a spirit of whatever. You could have a spirit of anger. How many of you understand that? That's your nature. That you've taken on the nature of being a person who's angry. Same thing with lust. Same thing with greed. That as we allow these things to come, they, they impact our nature and before long, it's who we are. See, our heart is the root system of all of our words, actions, and behaviors. Matthew chapter 12, 34, Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to those political religious people of his day. He, he says, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. See, real Christianity has never, ever, 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 ever been about do's and don'ts. I'm going to say it again so you get the picture because I, I'm about to eradicate some big misconceptions. Real Christianity has never, ever, ever been about do's and don'ts. Otherwise, we could achieve salvation by our good works, and that's absolutely impossible. Real Christianity is all about a continuous, everybody say continuous. continuous. A continuous heart change. That means it never stops. There is a change that's going on in our heart all the time. And when our heart stops changing, listen to pastor today, there's a big problem. That means we're just going through the motions. We're just coming to church. We're living more in hope than we are in faith. We hope that we're living right. We hope that he's full of grace and mercy. We hope that when we go to, we can go to heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. Real Christianity is all about a continuous, can everybody say continuous again? A continuous heart change. And what we have to understand in God's purpose is that Jesus came to earth to bring a complete restoration to man. Now we have to understand this. Sin changed the nature of man from being God-centered to being self-centered. In other words, sin changed the very nature of the heart. In Genesis 1.26... It says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And I want us to understand, God created man with a God nature. That, now, what this doesn't mean is man was not created with a God superpower. Man was not born to be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. When it says in the image and likeness of Almighty God, that means that man was created with the nature, the DNA nature of God. And the enemy comes in, you know the story, he comes in and deceives the woman and he, he says this little trick. He says, and you shall be like God, knowing good from evil. And that's really a trick. How many know that's a trick? Wait a minute. How many know that that's not true? Let me explain to you why that's not true and why it's a trick. God knows good from evil because God is always good. God hasn't experienced evil. Are you with me? God knows good from evil because God is always good. God, everybody say, God is, good. God is always good. He's not out to get you. God is always good. God doesn't know evil because he has experienced or evil is evil. 
So anything opposite or different from the nature of God, listen to this, is evil. Anything opposite of the nature of God is evil. But man in his discovery of evil, listen to what happened, lost the nature of God. When man discovers evil, he loses the nature of God. And it's impossible for us to understand the true power of God without first understanding the nature of God. Somebody say amen. I, I was thinking this morning, we love the ministry of Jesus, raising the dead, healing the blind, opening deaf ears, uh, touching the lepers. But one thing that we miss in Jesus, and it says, and he was moved with compassion. That is the nature of God upon humanity. That God's nature says, I am here for you, I am good, and I've come to do good for you. Somebody say amen today. Amen. That, that is good news. And so we need to understand, here we're going to say it again, man was created with a God nature. But because of sin that corrupted that nature, that all of a sudden we no longer see things as God sees them, we see everything as it impacts us. Even when we come to salvation, people say, I don't want to go to hell, so I better follow God. And so we need to understand the nature of God, and we're going to talk about some of his attributes for just a moment. Number one, God is holy. You know what that means? He is distinctly different and unlike anything or anyone else. He is beyond our human comparison. When we say God is holy, what we're saying is there is nothing or no one that compares to you. You are holy. God abounds in unconditional love. Somebody say amen. amen. That while we were yet sinners, the word of God says, Jesus died for you. While you were an enemy of God, Jesus died for you. God is absolutely secure in his nature. Now that's important. Because we were created in his nature and image. And so when I'm talking about these things, I want you to understand initially how man was created. God is long-suffering, kind, and merciful. God is just and true. And here's a big word that we don't use today, but it expresses who God is. God is immutable. And what that means is God doesn't change just because we change. Somebody, well, come on now, that's good news. Just because you're having a bad day doesn't mean God's having a bad day. Come on now. God doesn't change. He's immutable. That means he doesn't respond to us just because who and what we are. That's a real misconception on our part. God doesn't change his nature because of our behavior. <laughs> that, that's, that's good news today. God doesn't change. We, we say, well, I really messed up this week, so God must have his hammer out ready, ready to get me. Listen to Pastor Day. God hasn't changed his nature because of your behavior this week. That's not who he is. And so we can really miss God's plan. Because God is all about changing our nature, listen to me, not our behavior. And this is where we as the American church have missed it. Because it's easy to say, okay, let's make some rules. And if you want to be a part of our denomination, or if you want to be a part of our church, don't do these things. Here's our quote unquote code of conduct. And the word of God is really not about in the New Testament and the new covenant. It's not about a code of conduct. See, because you have to understand in order to change our nature, what has to happen is that our old root system has to die. Now, let's be honest today because this is church and we ought to be honest. There are a lot of people, a lot of good church people who really don't want the root system to die. Honestly, they would rather have the acceptance of people than they would of God. They'd rather have the love of people sometimes than the love of God. And so when we talk about killing the old root system, 
You know, we can pretend like we have and say, well, I've changed this and this, but you understand something, who you are is really determined in your secret place. It's really determined in your motive. It's really determined in the thoughts that you have. It reminded me of a story many, many years ago, Pastor Shelley and I started in ministry and man, we started early on. I I was about 21, she was 19. We were in between ministry opportunities and there was a guy that we'd grown up in church with and he really wanted to bless us. And so he began giving me some odd jobs. So I would come over his house and I would paint some walls or I would uh, do some landscaping for him, dig out some flower beds. You know, it was good to make a little bit of money uh, because we didn't have a lot of money and we appreciated being able to eat. And he had this banana tree in his backyard. He said, that banana tree is really a pest. And this happened over three or four month period. He said, I want you to go out there, do whatever you do, machete, whatever you have to do. I want you to cut that banana tree down. So I cut the banana tree down, cut it into pieces, put it in trash bags, put it out by the thing. About three weeks later, we went there and the banana tree had grown back. He said, why don't you cut that banana tree down again? I don't think he did a good job at that. So I went back there again and cut the banana tree down, even with the ground, mowed over it to make sure. Came back about three weeks, three weeks later and the banana tree had grown up again. And I'm not real smart sometimes, but I caught on. You understand something, you don't, you don't kill a plant just because you cut it off at the ground. You have to deal with the roots. And in order to kill the roots, now this is a long time ago for all you greenies here, don't get mad at me. I, I mean, you understand, to under kill the roots, what, what we did is I, I cut it to the ground and then I dug a little hole in the middle of that, uh, of that, of that banana tree and I poured some diesel down there. Out of the ground it came, into the ground it returned. <laughs> it's all natural. So my, if you have a problem with it, you understand it, it came out of the ground, I was just returning it to the ground. <laughs> Choked out the roots of that banana tree and it never came back. And that's really what has to happen in our life. In order to grow spiritually, God's not just dealing with what we see and what everybody else sees. He wants to deal with the unseen. He wants to deal with the deep root system within us. See, the great deception and distraction is sin because sin always distracts us from God's plan because we can come here today and we put a focus on our sin because it deceives our focus of perception. When we obsess upon, here we go, when we obsess upon sin, we obsess upon our salvation. Now, let, let's talk about the church for just a moment because we become something, I don't believe it's what God wants us to be because we come to church and I think everybody here had the best of intentions in being at church, but we come in church on Sunday and, and all of a sudden we realize we gotta get right with God. I mean, as people say, if I don't get right with God, he might strike me dead here today. We haven't had it happen yet, but I guarantee you we will have salvations like you've never seen if it ever happens here. <laughs> so it affects when we come to church. People say, I can't worship God because I've been a heathen this week. God hasn't changed who he is. But you see, our sin changed how we view him. And so people come to, come to church and because of their sin, they deal with all kinds of condemnation and condemnation is a faith killer. Right. You understand something, you can go through the motions and play church, but if you're living in pornography or you're in an affair or, you know, any kind, uh, type of thing that we're not responding to ongoing with the help of the Holy Spirit, we come to church and we deal with condemnation. So what happens and when we deal with condemnation, is we don't see anybody else but ourselves. We can't see the people here today that may be thinking of taking their own lives. We don't even see them. 
Uh, we don't see that person who has been struggling not only with their faith, but with addiction and they're on the edge of just giving up on everything. We don't, we don't see the people that their marriage is on the rocks and they're about to be divorced. See, I want you to understand, that's the consequence of sin. That's what sin does to us. Uh, it brings not only this self-deception, but it, it actually blinds us to others' needs. So we wind up always continually working on our actions, behaviors, and never allowing God to create and establish the root, his nature and his heart. But what we need to understand is, how many of you like me have read at least the Gospels in the Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. L let, me, let me go back so we can learn something today. If you've ever read the teaching of Jesus, Jesus never taught about changing behavior. Jesus taught about the change in our nature. Well, you may say, well, Jesus taught repentance because he began to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Isn't repentance about a change in behavior? Yes, but that change in behavior is connected to a bigger plan. It's connected to a change in nature. True repentance is never accomplished without the work of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. The Holy Spirit brings revelation and conviction. The Holy Spirit brings the power to change the be not only the behavior only, but to bring about a change in nature. But here's the, here's the difficulty. Because when John says in his epistle, there is a sin that leads to death, and that is the intentional sins, according to the Old Testament. That there were sins that you committed, and you understand something, they were very unintentional, they didn't have any thought, they weren't premeditated, and he understands there's a place to sacrifice for those sins at the altar, but he also is recognizing this place where we have an intentional going on in our life, and that creates a real issue. See, repetitive, unrepented, intentional sin, listen to pastor for just a moment, changes our nature. It changes our nature. And Jesus preaches the greatest sermon of all time and starting in Matthew chapter five. And it's all about this change in nature. You think he's talking about divorce, he's not talking about divorce. You think he's talking about murder, he's not talking about murder. He's talking about the motivations that lead us to these things. He's talking about our heart that leads us. He, he talks about adultery and he says, it's not really about the action, it's about what's in your heart. And then we come to Matthew 5, 43. Listen to this. And this is our jumping off point for the whole series. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way you'll be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Wait a minute, that's good news today. Somebody say amen. amen. For all your unsaved friends and loved ones, let me tell you something. God still loves them and still reaching out to them and still wants to bless them. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. He hasn't written them off. The word of God says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is the nature of God. That it says he reigns on the just and the unjust. This is his nature. But we're not just talking about the nature of God. We're talking about the God nature within. Because he said and it says is if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you any different from, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans, or the correct translation would be corrupt Gentiles do that. And then we come to verse 48 that's such a dilemma to so many people. But you are to be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. 
People say, I can't be perfect like God, and they give up. But you're not understanding this passage. Because that word perfect, let me, let me read you the Allen translation. Here you go. But you are to be, and here's what the word means, but you are to be complete and whole, even as your Father in heaven is complete and whole. He's complete. He's the whole package. He is secure. He doesn't allow your behavior to change who he is. Somebody say amen. See, Jesus is teaching something that there was a real misconception in the Old Testament that said, okay, we do this and this and God is going to get us. And they said, you're misunderstanding who God is. He's certainly just, but he is very long-suffering. Somebody say amen. That we look at the children of Israel and say, well, look how God took them and he took them out of their country. And did, you understand, uh, there's almost a thousand years of long suffering. Somebody, time after time after time. None of us here are going to live a thousand years on earth. Somebody say amen. amen. So God's love and mercy is more than enough for all of us in this lifetime. This passage is not about something we should do, and you can make the mistake. You say, well, I'm going to make it, I'm going to write it down on my refrigerator. I'm going to say, I'm going to love my enemies. Good luck. Because you understand something, it's not God. You're going to need luck because it's you can't accomplish it. Because in our sin nature, listen, we're always Conditional. Every relationship is conditional in the sin nature. That means you do this to me, okay. You do it again, okay. You do it a third time, fourth time, I'll say, I, well, I've had it with you. There is a new book I've read, Boundaries. <laughs> Come on now. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't have boundaries with you? Wait, wait a minute, it's good news. No matter what you did last night, no matter what you did this morning, you can come here and he hasn't changed. If you ask for forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive you. You can take it to the bank today. It's not about something we should do. Rather, it's about something we should become and be. You should become whole like your father in heaven is whole because Jesus came, listen to pastor, he came to bring back the original nature. Jesus came with the power of the Holy Spirit to reestablish in all of us, according to the word of God, the created nature where we're made in the image and likeness of God. The nature of God See, the greatest confusion in this teaching is the misunderstanding that we can possibly love our enemies and listen to this and do good to both the just and the unjust. It's impossible. You can't do it. Somebody, we're, we're, I, I am, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, seventh generation Texan. You, 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 st you, st you poke a Texan in the eye and he's probably not going to let you poke the other eye. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I mean, you understand, I am seventh generation redneck Texan. On both sides of my family, mom and dad. My great uncle died at the Alamo. On both sides of the family, they were both at the Battle of San Jacinto. I mean, we've been here a long time. We, we are some kind of stubborn. Somebody say amen. I love my heritage, but can't, I can't let my heritage overtake my calling. Because you understand, I was created to be whole like my father in heaven is whole. Now, let's get a whole picture of this, what this looks like. 
Because Jesus passed this test. It says, therefore, it was necessary, Hebrews 2.17, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. What does that mean? It meant that here they were, evil people trying to do evil things to the Son of Man, and he still came back and did good every day. For three years they tried to kill him, and for three years he did miracles that were so numerous that John says you couldn't even write them all down. From the time he awakened to the time he laid his head to rest, and any waking hour, there was a miracle. There was goodness coming out of him all the time, without exception. And every day that he was being good, every day evil people tried to kill him, and he still did good. It didn't change who he was, even to the cross. He never changed his nature. Woo! You understand something? He never succumbed to the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He never, he never succumbed to the political outlook of his day. He didn't succumb to the Romans. You understand, he was the son of God. He was the son of man and he had the nature of God. So no matter what anybody said about him or did to him, he still was the son of God, the son of man. Everybody understand where we're going with this? I'm talking to you about us becoming whole and not living in a place where we are so reactionary. We are so stinking reactionary to the world around us. We read a post on Facebook and man, our world goes sideways. Somebody say amen. Somebody messes us over and we're done, man. Our Christianity goes out the window. We want to kill somebody. Somebody say amen. Well, pastor, we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. Please scratch that off your bumper. Somebody say amen. The Bible says be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. That means that you are forgiven in order to have a heart change and for there to be continuous a heart change happening in you. And when the heart change stops, you understand something. It's a bad day. Yeah. And what Jesus says in this passage is this, God should be the only one to change our nature. Now here's a big statement, stay with me. Here's what he's teaching in this passage. Jesus taught that when we allow a change in our heart for others, we allow others to change our nature. That's what unforgiveness does. Unforgiveness changes your nature. That we're made in the image of likeness of God. He's, how many know he's always forgiving? And all of a sudden somebody hurts us and say, I'll never forgive them. What, what, what have you done? You've allowed that person to change your nature. Now there can't be a heart change. You say, well, I'll just limp into heaven. <laughs> no, you're misunderstanding why Jesus came and lived and died and was resurrected and gave us the Holy Spirit. He didn't come to deal with our behavior. He came to change our nature. Now this is big to me and I'm going to share it personally in just a moment. Stay with me. See, he wants us to become complete and whole as he's complete and whole. But being complete and whole means continuously, everybody say continuously, continuously, moving through life in our God nature. Our God nature is full of mercy. Our God nature is full of grace, full of forgiveness. That's why Jesus said, and we read it, Matthew 6, he says, don't judge. Why does he say don't judge? Because judging, judging changes our heart nature. Jesus lived three years on earth and he could have called fire down from heaven and killed everybody. 
Let, let's talk about the truth. He goes, I, I'm done with these guys. I do something good every day for them and all they do is want to kill me. Let's just go ahead. Some of your great, 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 great grandparents, let's just wipe them out. <laughs> and we would say, well, he was justified in doing so. Those people were evil. He didn't do that. Why didn't Jesus issue forth judgment when he was here on earth? Because it would have changed his nature. You see, when it's all said and done, it's your nature that will be judged before God. It's your heart and nature that will be judged before God. And so we need to understand how important this is for us. So what is our nature? Well, we're going to go to Galatians 5.22. You all know it. Galatians 5.22 says, but the Holy Spirit, and here's the key word, produces. He produces something in us that is not there. What is, what is he producing within us? He is producing in us a God nature. The Holy Spirit is in a work of production. If you're a Christian today, he is in the work of production of producing these things in your life. And if these things are not being produced in your life, listen to pastor today. There's a problem. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So we all look at this picture because we, we've heard this scripture so many times. We get the picture. We get the understanding. Okay, this is what he's supposed to be producing in us. But let's understand. Let's go to the opposite side of it for just a moment. If these things are produced in us, it's not the Holy Spirit. Unloving. That's the opposite of being loving, isn't it? Unhappy. Come on now. That's not, that's, not, that's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Living in upheaval and unrest. That's not peace, is it? Unruly and impatient. Unkind. Unkind. Unrighteous. Unreliable and inconsistent. Uncouth and hard-hearted, unruly, and out of control. The complete opposite of what the fruit of the Spirit is to be producing in our life. You understand that the old nature is there. This is what's going to happen. And this is the place that I've come to in my life. I was talking to my spiritual dad, which by the way, uh, he's doing much better from his stroke. And I appreciate all of you praying for Pastor Mackey. We were in the airport in Atlanta and I said, I'm going to give Jim a call before we go overseas. And I was talking to him about our plans for the future that uh, we're going we're to build a legacy ministry here at Life Community Church. No, I want you to understand something. This is not a pastor idea. This is a God idea. The, the word of God says in Malachi that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And it immediately, it's the last verse there in the Old Testament. And it says, if that doesn't happen, there's a curse that comes upon the land. Can I tell you something? If we don't prepare something for the next generation, there's a curse that comes. So we're going to leave a legacy ministry. We're going to raise up servants that are going to serve all over the world. They're going to serve in this church. They're going to serve in other churches. They're going to go all over the place because we have a great school. We have a, a great internship. The only problem that we've had over the years is that we've had people graduate and say, well, I want a job at the church. I don't have enough positions. But you know what? I've got enough relationships now that we can plug people in into servant ministries in Africa. In fact, I was leaving Jock on Friday and he said, if you could send me three right now, I could take three right now today. I said, I don't have three to send you right now that are ready to go. You understand something. It's not just sending a warm body. That does more harm than good. 
It's about sending a trained servant. Somebody that's willing to go and say, you know what? I don't care if I get any credit about this. I don't have to put this on Facebook or Instagram. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't have to do any of that. I'm going over here for God. This is what God told me to do. And I'm going to work behind the scenes. And it's God that gives a reward. That's security. Yes. That's not acting out of our insecurity that says, I've got to get some attention for this. I've got to get you to pat me on the back for this. Come on, bring it to me. That's why people always ask, well, pastor, I don't understand. You go to Africa at least once a year. You go to Romania and you don't post pictures. I don't. I don't self-promote what God is doing. Amen. Somebody say amen. If, I, if something's happening and I want to show you the picture of what's happening, I'm out of the picture. Because I don't have to take credit for any of that stuff. I, I mean, you understand, Pastor Jock's doing a great job. That's all him over there. I mean, he, because he's my friend, he's, in, he's my brother, he's invited me to be a part, which I am just absolutely flabbergasted by. I mean, you, you understand, I, some of you guys don't get this. This guy in his ministry in 15 years has reached 30 million people in Africa. He was finishing his master's thesis and he wants to build a church around community. And I don't say this to toot my horn. And of all the people that he knows in this country, which I could list a who's who, he called and interviewed me to do his master's thesis because he saw community at Life Community Church. He said, you guys know how to do community. If there's a church that knows how to do community, and I got to thinking, it wasn't, it wasn't an accident that God allowed us to name this church Life Community Church. See, this is part one of many weeks of, of thing, but we're going to recap everything today and under, come to an understanding of what this means. The Holy Spirit is here to change our nature. So I was talking to Jim. Let me finish that story. Pastor Shelley and I here have been here 29 years in November. We've been in ministry going on 40 years total. It's a long time. And I've been around long enough, Pastor Glenn and Danny, I've been around ministry long enough that I've seen guys be in ministry a long time and they get to the end of their ministry and they're not nice guys and so he, he said other than leaving this legacy which is incredible he was blown away by the legacy ministry we're going to create in, in our internship I said my, my goal and ambition is this is that when it's all said and done I'll be a kind man I'll be a kind man because you understand the God nature lives within me. When it comes to church, I'll be compassionate because I can look around and not just see my needs and what's going on in my life and my hurts. But the God nature says there are people here today that if God doesn't move on their heart, they're going to lose their marriage. They're in a faith crisis today. And you understand something, just because you're called to ministry doesn't mean that you're exempted from the God nature. Let, let, let me read the opposites of these things so you can understand. The opposites, again, unloving, unhappy, living in unupheaval and unrest, unruly and impatient. We had a guy in Johannesburg that got kicked off the airplane. Crazy enough is he, he had worked a job moving an oil rig all the way from Singapore. It's going all the way to Louisiana, this oil ship. And by trade, he is a police officer. He said it out loud. He was so drunk and out of control and so unruly that he was making comment to every woman that came by. 
couldn't control his mouth. And when he got on the plane, he couldn't control himself. And the next thing you know, they're taking him off the plane. Can I ask you a question? Do you think his company's going to find out about that? Do you think that the police department he works for is going to find out about his disorderly conduct? No self-control. What, what is the fruit of the Spirit he produces in us? Self-control. Unkind, unrighteous, unreliable, and inconsistent, uncouth, and hard-hearted. Unruly and out of control. That's the old nature. The Holy Spirit is here to change our nature. And so in order for that to happen, number one, is we have to embrace the bigger picture plan. The bigger picture plan is this. God is not here just to change my behavior. God is here today to change my nature. It's a bigger, it's a bigger deal if you're unkind. Listen to me. If you're unkind, you're going to have all kinds of other sins that happen. If you have no self-control, you're going to have all kinds of other sins that are happening. Somebody say amen. If we don't deal with the root system, you hear me what I'm saying today. We've made, we've made a living in America's church to talk about people's behaviors and forgiveness of behavior and never deal with the roots. God has a bigger picture plan for you, for you to become like him. Because the word of God says, we shall know him because we shall be like him. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. You understand something? You're not going to be like him if you're all these other things. If your old nature is in control. Right. Number two. What actions and behaviors are, are the result of my selfish nature and not my God nature? And here's the question I ask myself, am I unkind? Am I, ooh, am I impatient? Am I more times unhappy than I am joyful? Oh, that's good preaching. It got quiet here, but it's good preaching. <laughs> Number three. Is God my sole influencer of my nature? Oh, or have I allowed others to change my God nature? See, unforgiveness will change your God nature. Bitterness and resentment, it'll change your God nature. If you choose to be unkind, it's going to change your God nature. You've been hurt enough times, and we, this is what we say. Well, you know, give them some grace because they've been hurt. You understand something? We should give people grace. But you need to walk in, you need to walk in forgiveness. Quick forgiveness. Not, well, I want to see them pay a little bit before I forgive them. That's not our God. Let me give you some good news today. Here, here's some good news about God today. No matter how filthy you've been, no matter how many times you've done it, he hasn't given up on you and he still wants to change your nature. He's not going to turn you away today. And that's the nature we're to have within us, rich in grace and mercy. There are people here today that hold things against dead people. There are people here today that hold things against politicians they don't even know. That makes them unkind. I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven. I'm not talking about being an American today. Do you hear what I just said? That all of a sudden their nature changes just at the sound of one politician's name. And my nature changes. And I'm saying, they're an idiot. Is, is that the God nature? Come on now. Number four. 
Number four, a bigger picture perspective always comes with a bigger picture plan. That means that God has a plan to change your nature. But it's not going to happen unless you let him deal with the roots. He keeps coming back unless you let him deal with the roots. And, and you know, I love our CR program. We have, we have finding freedom that happens as well. All those things happen. And all, the, all, that, all that is is this. This is all that it is. For you to come to the discovery with the help of the Holy Spirit of where the roots are. Because some people are so blinded, they get, and so blinded by our other nature, we can't see where the roots are. All of a sudden we realize, I'm blaming everybody else for the state of my life. And it's not everybody else's issue. See, I want us to understand something. A lot of, a lot of the agendas in this country aren't Democrat, they're not Republican, they're evil agendas against the kingdom. Because the enemy wants you to stay in your old nature and not in your new nature in Christ Jesus. Where you can be perfect and whole as your Father in heaven is perfect and whole. That you can abide in peace, love, and joy. You know why? Because you've got the nature of God within you. You can live in peace, love, and joy. Does that mean there's not conflict? No, there is conflict, but you're a quick forgiver. You abound in mercy and grace. See, we have to listen to the Holy Spirit and follow his very specific instructions. How many of you like me? How many of you like me have ever heard the Holy Spirit say, don't do that? Don't go there. No, no, let, let's be honest today. How many times every week in this place, every Sunday, people get delivered? No, this happens every Sunday, believe it or not. Every Sunday, people get delivered from here. And Monday, they hear that still small voice that says, don't even go there. How I many know what I'm talking about? And they walk right back in the mess. Because it's more uncomfortable in the place they know whether, than walking in the newness that they don't know. They would rather walk in the muck and crap that they do know. Come on now. Than the blessing nature of God that they don't know. And we've got to understand something today. God in his nature is so loving and so caring that he wants the very best for your life. He's not out to get you. He's not out to hammer you. He's not out. He, he is here because he wants you to take on his nature and become like him. That when other people aren't determining who you are. But we've gotten so out of it because we so focus on the behavior that, like I said, we see something on social media and all of a sudden that person is impacting who we are. And the rest of our day is shot. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Listen to this. No matter what people do, it doesn't change him. He reigns on the just and the unjust. Amen. And we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, which he's given us. He lives inside of us. So when you've asked Jesus to come to your heart, the Holy Spirit now is resident within you. And we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how they play out in this. Because in this nature, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit flow out of us but they flow out of the God nature. The gifts of the Holy Spirit flow out of the God nature. It's not something that is outside of the God nature. It doesn't work that way. Somebody say amen. It always worked. And Jesus was moved to compassion and he healed all of them. Out of the God nature, the miraculous comes. How many of you would like to see the miraculous in your, in your life? Stand with me this morning. Ooh, a lot to un unpack. Hopefully we got a good start on that. How many of you understand? How many think we got on a good start on that?
How many of you want God to begin to change your heart and nature? Can I see your hands today? Raise your hand. Lord, we come with uplifted hand. Honest, it doesn't matter how long we've come to church or what our perception of our spirituality is or whether we're mature or immature, we need you to change our heart and nature. Holy Spirit, we want you to produce within us the nature of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Lord, all nine of those fruit that you produce within us, we need that production to go on in our life today. Lord, lead, let us leave this place today and be kind and patient. Change our nature. And Lord, I ask that we might hear you when you speak to us this week. Don't go there. Don't need to look at that. We understand you're changing us that we choose your nature above that old nature today. We choose it. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you, Lord, that you're healing marriages today. I thank you, Lord, that you're even here healing the sick in body today because that's who you are. You've not changed. The word says that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you're here in this place and you're doing all these things because we're asking you to. Lord, you, you are freeing the addicted, the addicted people today. People that have no control. Lord, you are freeing them. And in your nature, they have control today. And we believe that in Jesus' name. And I thank you for these things. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask our pastors to come. If you need prayer of any kind today, you say, Pastor... I need to start and I need somebody to agree with me. We have people here to pray with you and agree with you. Be ashamed to be, come to the house of God and not have somebody pray for you when you need prayer. There's somebody here to pray for you. We love you. God loves you. He certainly wants the best for your life. Go with God today. We'll see you soon. You're dismissed.